Neil starts right now. Good morning. It's Wednesday, December 28th. Thanks for joining us. We will have the latest on all the travel troubles happening around the country. But first, let's talk about the nice weather that we are expecting with Mia. Absolutely. It was a little chilly out there this morning, but the good news is lows for the most part were above freezing. So we're seeing that warming trend already take place. That's going to continue <coughs> into the afternoon as well. And really, as we head into the second half of the week and approach the New Year's weekend, let's start off, though, with a look at temperatures right now. Sunshine, plenty of it, helping those temperatures warm pretty efficiently. We're in the upper 40s, low 50s here as we approach the 9 a.m. hour. 48 officially over at the airport, 49 in comfort, 47 over at Port SA. We will see plenty of sunshine into this Wednesday afternoon, helping those temperatures warm into the upper 60s and low 70s out there. So that's that warming trend that we've been talking about. Also could get a little breezy at times. Winds gusting upwards of about 20 to 25 miles per hour. A quick check at our pollen count this Wednesday molds and mountain cedar both in the pollen count, but they are low. So that is the good news there. That breezy south wind is going to pump in some additional humidity, so it's going to be even warmer out there tomorrow. We've got more cloud cover as well as the chance for some patchy fog in the morning. So we'll talk about that as well as what we could find heading into the upcoming holiday weekend in just a few. But first, let's head over to Stephen for a check at the traffic. Well, thank you, Mia Montgomery. Let's get a look here. It's been a very nice morning out on the roadways as well to match some of the nice weather we're seeing. Uh, sunglasses may be a good idea. Check out 35 at Nogalitos. We do have a pretty blurry shot there, but thankfully traffic in the north and southbound lanes even there at 37 is pretty much empty, uh, which is great. You can take advantage of these quiet roadways. But as we were talking about some of the travel trouble happening around the country, we know some people may be looking to the roads as an alternative to get to their destination. So let's just take a quick peek at these gas prices from AAA because as of right now, just check the update. Uh, they were still pretty much the same as of this morning, $2.58 right here in Bear County, $2.70 around the state and around the country. Today's national average $3.13. So again, for those that maybe have to fuel up before any big road trips that may have been unexpected due to some air travel trouble. But let's get you back here on Transguide. Although the roads have been quiet, we also know that there's plenty of road construction that is taking place. And if you're new to the Alamo City, scan this QR code. This is really helpful. It'll help you plan your commute ahead of time. That'll take you to our KSAT traffic page. It has a full list of all the current closures that are taking place right now and all the way up until the new year. Mark Steph. Thank you, Stephen. The chaos at airports across the country continues this morning with FlightAware reporting more than 4,000 flight cancellations today. Most of those are with Southwest Airlines. San Antonio International Airport has not been spared from the disaster. Our Sarah Costa joins us live in the studio with the latest numbers on those cancellations. The troubles Morning. continue, don't they? They continue, and it's not just flight cancellations and people strain at the airport. Now you have to mix in lost bags and the need for rental cars across the country. So basically, this is a cluster. Winter storm causing the majority of these cancellations at first, but it was basically the Southwest system that crashed, which has turned this into a continued chaos as we continue to see those cancellations. But let's take a look at the local numbers of flights impacted. At recent check, there were 40 canceled arrivals and 30 canceled departures at the San Antonio International Airport. Now, all of these flights I checked are Southwest, Southwest flights that are canceled, except for two of them. So these numbers of cancellations have only gone up since I started checking this website every hour since 4 o'clock this morning and stressed and stressed Branded Southwest passengers fuming after the airline canceled more than 2,500 flights on Tuesday, following thousands more earlier this week. Southwest CEO Bob Jordan apologizing, saying the airline's point-to-point -point operating system, which relies on a network of direct flights, is especially vulnerable to challenges like severe weather, making for a slower rebound than its competitors. So Jordan says Southwest will significantly reduce flights over the coming days in hopes of being back on track before next week. Southwest Airlines Pilots Union says the carrier's outdated IT system is leaving stranded customers on hold for hours. The Southwest fallout prompting a U.S. Department of Transportation investigation. So another disaster I alluded to, the thousands of bags that are lost or misplaced across the country in these airports. Now, this video was taken at the Denver International Airport. People say they have been waiting at the baggage claim line for hours, some bringing their own chairs to wait in line. News outlets are reporting that at the Denver International Airport, anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000 
thousand unclaimed bags in the baggage claim area. Another disaster has been rental car agencies. Hundreds of people trying to rent cars to drive to their destinations. Some people drive opting to drive over a thousand miles across the country who don't want to be stranded waiting for a flight until after the new year, leaving a big shortage of rental cars also available in the U.S. Steph. Thank you, Sarah. What a big mess out there. And we will keep you, of course, keep track of the very latest at the San Antonio International Airport and travel concerns nationwide. We're going to keep you updated on air and online on our website, KSAT.com. When your morning headline to Mega Millions is even more mega. And we've said it before, in extreme conditions, heroes are born. It happened in the middle of all that snow up in Buffalo, New York. Plus an avalanche that just buried some skiers and a dance off between an eighth grader and his teacher. David Sears is here. Morning. Morning. This is going to put a smile on your face. The dance off. Yeah, that's pretty good stuff. Okay. We'll have that for you in just a second. But first, more records being broken this time. It's the amount of the Mega Megans. By the time Friday rolls around, it's going to be well over 640 million. According to folks at the lottery, this will be the largest prize at the end of any year. So happy new year to the winner of that pot of money. Mm -hmm. So at 640 million right now, the cash option to be about 328 million. Then there are the taxes, so that will put another din in the pot, but still not a bad way to start the new year. The last time someone had the winning ticket for Mega Millions was back on October 14th. Two winners split 502 million. And remember the last summer, the jackpot was over a billion for the third time. Another tidbit, only six jackpots have been won this year in California, Florida, New York, Minnesota, Illinois, and Tennessee. About time for Texas to win. All right, there's the Cajun Navy and now the Buffalo Snow Angels. We are talking about these friends and their snowmobiles, and they are helping out the folks in that storm in Buffalo. While people were getting stranded under feet of snow for hours and even days, William Kess and his buddies headed out on their snowmobiles to save those they could. They picked up anybody and everybody, got them to safety. They included people, pets, even delivered some food. Eddie Porter was one of those who was actually trying to help save people. He ended up getting stranded himself, spent 19 hours under that snow. Then he heard that sweet sound of the snow angels on their snowmobiles. And these guys were helping people and he said he knew a place he could take us and he would help us out. I guess God said the angel. I wasn't expecting to do as much as we did and not realizing how many people really needed our help. Had he not been there, I might be dead, honestly, because where was I going to go? Where was we going to walk to but in them conditions? The thank yous and, you know, the, 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 the text messages from people out of state and family members, it's priceless, you know what I mean? It's beautiful, honestly, it really is. Always good to see people step up and help out. At least 31 have died in that storm in Buffalo alone. More than 50 have died due to the winter storm across the country. But thanks to those heroes, they have saved even more. All right, let's take it to Austria. That is an avalanche. And you see these little black dots right there? Those are skiers, and they are getting buried in that avalanche. There was 10 of them covered in snow. The video being shot by another skier on a hill above all that action. And here's their reaction as they watch it all happen right in front of them. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yo, we got to go check on those people. Now they went down there and checked on them. At first, rescuers thought some of the skiers were missing, but they were able to find all 10. Only four of them needed medical attention. The rest probably needed a uh, little hot toddy to, to, to warm up after that. And finally, some holiday school fun. How about a dance off between an eighth grader and one of his teachers is happening between exams on back on December 23rd. It's going on in Florida. The eighth grader showing off his moves right in front of Yolanda Turner. That was a courageous move right there. Ooh, but yeah. then Miss Turner took it right back at him. Here oh. we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have a winner. Yeah, I think so. That's Look at Miss awesome. Turner. Laying down a little robot for you. <laughs> Who had more, more fun, her yeah, or I, everybody the else? I think all the kids were just up. totally impressed. Look at that. And then she just like in his face and walks off. I like it. It's a walk, off. <laughs> it's a walk <laughs> off win right there. Dude, take I that. I love it. That's fantastic. See you back in class. You're right. <laughs> That's we, right. <laughs> we are smiling. All right. Thank you, David. Good. See you in a bit. 907, 48 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. A couple from California is sharing their story in hopes of other parents and teens will avoid the suffering that they're experiencing after their son died from a fentanyl overdose. overdose. Plus, a look at your 9 at 9, including news about an ailing Pope Benedict and what lawmakers believe will solve the U.S. border crisis. 
And welcome back. It's 9-11. Here's today's 9 at 9. After being upheld Tuesday, Title 42 is likely headed back to the Supreme Court one day. The Trump era policy clears the way for deporting at least 2.5 million asylum seekers. Critics on both sides of the political aisle acknowledge whatever happens to Title 42's long term future, the problem won't be solved until Congress reforms the immigration system. The travel meltdown continues today. 2,600 more flights are canceled nationwide. Nearly all of them, Southwest Airlines flights. The airline CEO apologizing and saying more delays are likely this week, with no indication of when passengers would be rebooked. The transportation secretary is vowing to hold Southwest accountable for the mess he says it created. Pope Francis has announced that his predecessor, Pope Benedict, is very sick and asked for prayers for the 95-year-old former pontiff. In 2013, Pope Benedict XVI shocked the world by making the almost unprecedented decision to resign from his position, citing advanced age. In 2020, the Vatican said Benedict had suffered from a painful but not serious condition following reports that he was ill. January 6th committee members released a new batch of transcripts, including two more of its interviews with former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson. It shows Hutchinson and her lawyer, who was funded by Trump, appeared to argue several times when she testified before the committee last May. Hutchinson eventually switched lawyers and appeared before the committee weeks later to clarify and, quote, correct some of her previous testimony. Former President Donald Trump's tax returns are scheduled to be released Friday morning. The House Ways and Means Committee has had the records for some time, but it wasn't clear whether they would be released to the public. Many Republicans argued they should remain private. Trump was the only president since Gerald Ford not to voluntarily release his tax returns, despite multiple promises to do so. Emergency rooms in children's hospitals are seeing more visits and revisits related to mental health. According to a study beginning in 2015, mental health visits to pediatric emergency departments increased 8% every year for five years. About 13% of those patients revisited the hospital within six months. Researchers called the analysis concerning. Public health experts fear there could be another surge in respiratory viruses following holiday gatherings and New Year's Eve celebrations. Another factor is the wave of flight cancellations sweeping the country. The CDC says seasonal flu activity remains high in the U.S. but continues to decline in most parts of the country. COVID-19 increases appear to be relatively mild. Rising mortgage rates could be affecting demand to buy a home and driving prices lower. According to numbers from the S&P's core logic case, Schiller National Home Price Index, home prices fell for the fourth straight month in October. Analysts believe that home prices will continue to fall in 2023. The microchip shortage that once plagued the supply chain early in the pandemic seems to have subsided. According to the Wall Street Journal, there's now an oversupply of microchips, and industry insiders say tech products are not flying off the shelves like they once did. And that's today's Nine at Nine. Outside with live cam, same time yesterday, we'd only warmed up to about 44 degrees, but 50. Hey, we're making progress, man. Absolutely, and we've got plenty of sunshine. That's one of the reasons why. It's still relatively dry air, but that's going to change throughout the day today. The humidity is kind of making its way back into south central Texas. That's going to help that warming trend that we've been talking about over the past few days continue. So we were colder than average yes. for Christmas. And as we head into the upcoming New Year's Eve weekend, now we're looking at some warmer than average temperatures throughout the remainder of the week. So let's take a look at your weather headlines, what we're monitoring here in San Antonio and surrounding areas over the next several days. Today, more sunshine, especially into the afternoon hours, helping those temperatures warm into the upper 60s and low 70s for those daytime highs. But we are going to see a breezy south wind at times pump in more of that Gulf moisture and humidity. And where you're really going to notice that first thing tomorrow morning, tomorrow's going to be a lot more cloudy outside and in the morning we're going to have the potential to find some patchy fog as well as some areas of drizzle and we'll have the potential to find an isolated light shower or two mainly east of San Antonio by late morning and into the early afternoons. So we'll talk about that as well as that warming trend warmer than average temperatures that will take us into the upcoming holiday weekend. Good news is though more sunshine looks to return for both New Year's Eve as well as New Year's Day and speaking of the sunshine 
and taking you back outside right now. We've got plenty of it here in San Antonio. Need our little forecast icon to catch up there. Temperature officially over at the airport checking in at 48 degrees. As of right now, nothing huge or hefty when it comes to those winds. But again, it could get a little breezy out there into the afternoon at times. 49 in Bulverde this hour. Same on the east side of town over at Randolph. 49 in Rio Medina, 45 in Bandera, and just a degree warmer, 46 in Kerrville, checking in up there in Kerr County. Now, with all of that sunshine in place, again, temperatures will warm pretty efficiently into the afternoon. We're near about 71 already by 2 p.m. We've got a forecast high around 72 here in San Antonio. And then if you're stepping out for any Wednesday evening plans, we'll see those temperatures fall into the 60s later this evening, especially after the sun goes down. But again, in terms of those daytime highs, you can see that warming trend definitely continues around 68 for that forecast high this afternoon in Bulverde, 75 on the south side of Bear County, same stretching over to Floresville out there in Wilson County, 73 in Divine this afternoon and 71 in Sabinal. Again, we don't have really anything too strong in terms of wind gusts, but into this afternoon, I think those south winds could gust upwards of about 20 to even 25 miles per hour at times. And what that south wind does for us, it allows more of that Gulf moisture to work its way back into south central Texas. And what that's going to do for us tomorrow morning, yes, more of a muggy feel stepping out the door, but it also is going to allow for some areas of patchy fog to develop as well as some areas of drizzle. So don't be surprised if you do find that stepping out tomorrow morning. Overall, we'll call it about a 20% potential. We've got a 10% chance for maybe a stray lingering shower on Friday, and then we really dry things out as we head into New Year's Eve and New Year's Day this weekend. But we'll talk about that also very isolated chance to find a stray shower mainly east of town tomorrow. As we take a look farther off to the west, there's an area of low pressure in the upper levels of the atmosphere closer to the Four Corners region. And essentially what that's going to do over the next 24 hours is track eastward, approach the plains, and as it does so, it slingshots just enough energy into our atmosphere when combined with that humidity and moisture in place that could pop up again a few very isolated light showers into tomorrow afternoon, really early afternoon, mainly east of San Antonio, closer to places like Gonzales, reaching over to Shiner as well. All of that then moves away from our area farther up to the northeast into tomorrow night. Then heading into our New Year's Eve weekend, only about a 10% chance for a stray lingering shower on Friday, but into Saturday and Sunday will dry things out even more so. You can see your temperatures in the morning a bit warmer than what we've seen over the past several mornings. So we're starting off near about 50, so still a slight chill in the air Saturday morning and into Sunday as well. But your temperatures into the afternoon, yes, warmer than average. So taking a look at those daytime highs around 73 tomorrow, 74 as we head into our Friday into next week. It's possible that we see those afternoon highs climb into the upper 70s, approaching 80, and then maybe another front moves in early next week to knock those temperatures down just a little bit. So we were very, very cold and now yeah. we're kind of on the upward, upward roller coaster trend. I'll take the break though. It was uh, a little too cold. It was, yeah. especially like we'll give all the pipes a break, you know, mm -hmm. the plants yes. and, and all of those freeze preparations. Thankfully, we don't really need to deal with that over the next several days. That's good news. Thank yep. you, Mia. You bet. Thank you, ma'am. 920, 50 degrees. And she was nominated for an Oscar in 1959, but never got the full recognition she deserved. When we come back, the grandson of actress Juanita Moore shares his grandmother's struggles and how she paved the road for other people of color in Hollywood. 923 next year, an injustice is set to be corrected along the Hollywood Walk of Fame when Juanita Moore finally gets her own star over a dozen years after her death. Juanita Moore paved the way for other black performers in Hollywood, but as ABC's Sandy Kenyon reports, a new documentary makes clear Moore never got the recognition she so truly deserved. I'm available. You, me. Juanita Moore earned an Oscar nomination back in 1959 and made more than 70 movies, but her name isn't familiar to a younger generation. Her legacy was she persevered. She kept going, she never stopped. 
Kirk Kellycon is her grandson, and his movie is called A Star Without a Star because along the Hollywood Walk of Fame, there is no mention of her. An injustice that's due to be corrected soon, thanks in large part to this documentary. I'm glad that she will be getting one. Uh, and I'm glad that we did persevere with the film, uh, but I just think that it should have been much sooner. The obstacles he faced getting her a star mirrored his grandmother's own fight in the 1950s, a fight shared by the late Sidney Poitier. He had to behave in a certain stereotypical way in order to find a job, to get a job, to hold a job. So it was slow going. After Moore was nominated for playing a maid in Imitation of Life, she made a decision. I didn't want to carry the trays anymore. So Moore refused to play any more maids, and the result was she didn't work for a year. That was horrible. What it says about Hollywood is that they couldn't break the stereotype. You have an Oscar nomination, and okay, well, we're just going to keep her as a maid. And yet Moore still managed to break through. Sister Anne. She is one of the people that not only looked like me, but made me proud to look like me. She was a pioneer in a time and a place where this was not allowed. I love you so much. Sandy Kenyon, ABC News, New York. And the time now, 925 and 51 degrees for now. More ahead on GMSA at 9, including highlights from the Spurs game last night in Oklahoma City. Our guys have been busy lately. Very hectic schedule. David Sears will be back to recap the loss. But before that, a warning for parents about the dangers of fentanyl and what they should be talking to their kids about. And as we head to break, we want to introduce you to some of our KSET photojournalists. KSET is airing a one-hour special tomorrow night at 9 p.m. presented by our talented staff. They will tell you what stories they remembered most in 2022 and take you behind the scenes of what goes into covering all the stories you see here on KSET 12. So tune in tomorrow evening for that special. We'll be right back. Welcome back to 2021. The CDC says more than 71,000 people in the U.S. died due to overdosing on synthetic opioids, mostly fentanyl. While the kids are home during winter break, it might be a good time to check in with them and talk to them about the dangers of taking drugs. CNN's Josh Campbell spoke with the parents of one teen who died after taking a fentanyl-laced pill, and they hope their story will sound the alarm for other families. I found Zach. Um, asleep at his desk, his head was laying down on his arm. I could feel before I even touched him that something was horribly wrong. Every parent's worst nightmare. 17 year old Zach Didier found unresponsive in his room two days after Christmas of 2020. Medics arrived and began resuscitation efforts, but it was too late. And I started resuming CPR and they just stood there and I got mad at them and said, guys, help me save my boy. When they didn't. I started trying to talk to Zach and begged him, don't go. Come back. Please come back. Do not go. I walked up and Chris just said, her baby is gone. Zach's sudden death initially a mystery to investigators, but the Placer County coroner near Sacramento had two theories on the day of his death, either an undetected medical issue or fentanyl. And that further spiraled us into, into confusion, <laughs> yeah, debilitating yeah. confusion. It's like, why would you say that word? We had no red flags of Zach having struggles with any kind of drug use or addiction or depression. Nine out of every 10 overdose deaths in teenagers involves opioids and most commonly involves fentanyl. Dr. Scott Hadlin is head of adolescent and young adult medicine at Boston's Mass General for Children Hospital. Fentanyl is so potent that teens, particularly teens who have never used an opioid before and have no tolerance to them, can die really quickly. We're talking within seconds to minutes. New CDC data indicate the most common place for teens to overdose is at home. And experts say there are various reasons they turn to pills. About two out of every five teens who overdose has a history of struggling with depression, anxiety, or other mental health problems. And in many cases, these problems have gone unaddressed. In Los Angeles County alone, health officials recently announced accidental fentanyl overdoses skyrocketed over 1,200% from 2016 through 2021. 
the problem is very serious, uh, not just in the city of L.A., but nationwide. To understand where many teens are obtaining fentanyl, we spoke with an LAPD narcotics detective. We agreed not to name him as his work involves undercover operations. The more personal uh, sites would be Facebook, Marketplace, Instagram, uh, and Snapchat. If you're buying it on a social media account or you're buying it from somebody on the street or a friend, then most likely it's going to be counterfeit. If you look at these photos, the fake pill looks just like the real pill. Uh, they sure do. The dealer's main objective is to get you hooked. And if you don't die from it, then you're a customer for as long as you live. In Zach Didier's case, his parents said he met a drug dealer on Snapchat who sold him a deadly fentanyl pill that Zach thought was a pain reliever Percocet. Zach's case was really the first for our county dealing with whether or not to hold someone who provides drugs to someone else who ultimately dies, whether or not to hold them responsible for their death, and if so, how much? The message to dealers are we are fed up. We are tired of seeing young people dying in our communities. Zach's dealer was sentenced to 17 years in prison. But Placer County's district attorney, who has advocated for aggressive charges against dealers, says prosecution alone won't solve the fentanyl crisis. The solution will be education and awareness and talking to parents, talking to teachers. I've had a lot of struggle and challenge. Warning families about the dangers of fentanyl has become a life mission for Zach's parents, who now spend countless hours going into schools, telling their shattering story. As hard as it is to talk about it and as hard as it is to share the story, I feel him with me when I do it. I feel him helping me find the words even. It was seen as Josh Campbell reporting. And if you are looking for local substance use recovery resources, you can call a free hotline at the number on your screen. That's 210-729-2273. Outside with live cam up to 52 degrees now on your Wednesday morning. Beautiful blue skies out there, Mia Montgomery. Absolutely. Yep, that sunshine's going to stick with us into the afternoon hours, and that's what's contributing to these warmer temperatures. Really, each afternoon, just a little bit warmer than the previous one. And same for the mornings as well. Earlier this morning, above freezing temperatures for the majority of South Central Texas. But yes, taking a look outside with those temperatures right now, a Approaching that 50 degree mark at the airport surround Bear County, 48 over at SA International, 49 at Stinson, as well as Randolph and 47 over at Kelly. There's that sunshine in the forecast this afternoon. Check out that daytime high around 3 to 4 p.m. in the low 70s here in town. And as we head into our Thursday, Friday, and even into the upcoming New Year's Eve weekend, those 70s look to stick with us as well. But the biggest difference that you'll notice besides warmer mornings in the works over the next few days is also the added humidity. Tomorrow is going to be a pretty muggy one across San Antonio that also could lead to some areas of patchy fog in the morning, maybe an isolated stray shower, especially east of San Antonio into the lunchtime hour and early afternoon. We're pretty quiet into the upcoming holiday weekend, but yes, above average and warmer than average temperatures expected. We'll have another full look at what is in the forecast over the next several days in just a bit, guys. Under last night. Yeah, she was saying the Spurs couldn't get ahead of them. Yeah, David Sears here with a recap of last night's game. And one of the things we were talking about this morning, Dave, is how hectic the schedule has been for the Spurs this year. Well, you look at it, they played last night, they played the night before here at home, beat Utah in those uniforms. Woo, Steph, where were we? Did you see those uniforms? Steph? They were bad. It was like a fishing lure. Uh, yeah. You know, you're like a uniform aficionado. Yes. For the Spurs. I, I, like, I prefer the Fiesta. Well, Utah's—they look like chartreuse. They look like about chartreuse. Utah's. They, oh, they were, oh they, Utah's! I was like, those no. dudes could go yeah. deep in the woods and we could find them. <laughs> That's true. Those things were so bright. This is true. I mean, you couldn't—you know—they could sink down in the ocean. We could find them at the bottom. This is things. also true. Well, that, that might be helpful. But I just wanted to, you know, because I know you—you you and your your. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Usually, I'm looking at the spurs. Your outfits. Yes, that the, the outfits wear. that the spurs are wearing. Yeah. Sometimes it makes a difference. They could have used the Fiesta ones last yeah. night because they were in Oklahoma <laughs> yeah. City, and man, it did not go well. I think they led like in the second or in the first quarter and then after that it was uh katie barred the door it was all over pop got tossed out in the second quarter he got too quick i mean they were that quick Just like that he was uh do your job do your job and the referee said okay you do your job you but think you think he plants it. those uh, sometimes okay. but I don't, there he is there he there is. is right there do your job Beep. 
See you. Thanks, Pop. Appreciate you showing up. He's gone. So, but look at him. He's like, ah, I don't care. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting beat up pretty good today. So um, the problem, several problems last night with the Spurs. Their defense was like uh, really holy. I mean, those guys were Swiss like cheese. taking it to the, to the hoop. The Oklahoma City Thunder shot 31 free throws. The Spurs had like, I think they shot like 14. So there was a discrepancy there. Yeah. So a lot of fouls on the Spurs. Um, they were making like all kinds of shots. The Spurs hung in there for a while, but then uh, in the fourth quarter, OKC opened it up with a 14 to four run, 14 to three run. Yeah, 14 to three run to open up the fourth quarter. The Spurs actually won the third quarter, but then they only scored 21 in the fourth quarter. So, so here's, here's the problem. That was a back to back, right? Right. So now they're home and they play New York. And then for the rest of the month of January, they play every other day. Oh, wow. Earning so that paycheck. These college kids are about to get introduced to the NBA. Because, you know, in college, you only play, what, one every four or yeah. five days, maybe twice a week, unless you're in the tournament at the end, and then you'll play two on a weekend or something. Uh, so we are talking about fourth go. quarter fades. And, yeah. and could fatigue be a factor? Yeah, it, it could be. Yeah. And, you know, that's going to be the problem just to see how these guys hold up. Fortunately, pretty much everybody is healthy. Mm -hmm. So they got a, they got a deep bench and they got a lot of players. But, I mean, this is, this is going to be a test of uh, – what kind of shape these guys are really in. Because it's going to be tough. So tomorrow night, right here at home, 7 o'clock, AT&T Center against the Knicks. Now, to be fair, you did also say in the newsroom this morning that overall the Spurs are playing pretty well right now. I think they're playing maybe above what, what a lot of people expected. Right. I think they're playing a little bit better. They're ju they just can't seem to get two or three going in a row and, and get consistent play from from everybody it's it's you know usually it's Devin Vassell or it's Kelvin right. Johnson or it's one of these guys so once they get a little more consistent then I think they'll win some more games but uh, I think they're probably pretty much where we thought they would be okay you okay know? well maybe by January 13th they'll have it together hopefully oh well, that's the big day I yeah. uh, see that's the anniversary game that's, yes. a, that's I think they've sold like four like 50,000 tickets for that yeah one so it's far. gonna be loud in, in there, in there. So, yeah, oh man gonna it's fun. gonna be awesome it's gonna be fun all right so, all right David thank you go Spurs go go yeah, Spurs go, go. 939 52 degrees you're watching GMSA at nine and as we get closer to the start of the new year final preparations are being made for the big ball drop in Times Square when we come back why this will say this year's celebration will be a special one. Just about 9.43, we're just days away from the start of a new year and crews in New York City are working overtime on those last minute preparations for the big party in Times Square. ABC's Will Gans shows us some of the work behind the scenes as well as some other New Year's traditions in other parts of the country. Five, four. The countdown is officially on to 2023. In Port Clinton, Ohio, they'll mark the new year by dropping a giant walleye named Wiley. Panama City, Florida drops a beach ball, naturally. And in Princess Anne, Maryland, they'll celebrate with a stuffed muskrat dive. But the main event will be here in Times Square, New York City. You know, it's like our Eiffel Tower or Great Wall of China or something. It's something that Americans just really connect to. Final preparations underway for the party of the year and everyone is on the guest list. We have found ways to carry on our traditions each year during the pandemic. And this year we are welcoming the world back without any restrictions. So come early, get a great space and happy New Year. And that iconic star of the celebration, the Times Square Ball, 12 feet in diameter with over 2,600 crystal panels. The 2023 theme of this year's Waterford Crystal Design, Gift of Love. We need this after the pandemic. We've all gone through a horrendous two years. We've come out the other side of it and we've come out better. The ball weighs over 11,000 pounds, which is more than two Chevy Tahoes. Then a few days from now, New Year's Eve, 1.2 billion people are approximately around the world watching the ball drop. Ryan Seacrest hosting the New Year's Rock and Eve celebration for his 18th year in a row, counting down to 2023 with some of his own favorite moments of New Year's Eve's gone by. From Taylor to Mimi, to Dick Clark himself. There's no other moment like it where we're all doing the same thing at the same time, filled with hope for 2023. 
Today, Times Square is celebrating its annual Good Riddance Day, a chance for people to say a final farewell to the hurdles, frustrations, and anything negative they wish to leave behind in 2022. As for New Year's Eve, the confetti test will be held on Thursday, and the ball test will be held on Friday, just one day before the main event on Saturday night. Will Gans, ABC News, New York. I've been in New York for Thanksgiving, but I've not been there for New Year's Eve. Oh, and based wow. on what we see on TV, I always thought staying close together. Yeah. I always thought it would be like this in Manhattan yes, on New Year's yeah. Eve that, with that's the ball how drop. That's how you keep warm. Well, that's yeah. also true. <laughs> that's that's really, one way to do it. I need to look up what the forecast is for New York City this weekend. I'd be pretty interested to see. Uh, and all that pavement and buildings seem right. to hold in the heat and right. hold in the cold. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, well, I don't know, for some that maybe really, really like the cold, it's going to be a little bit warmer this weekend, especially compared to what we saw mm -hmm. last weekend. Let's take a look at that New Year's Eve weekend forecast mm -hmm. here in San Antonio. Very festive, right? A lot of fireworks there. Uh, we'll start off in the low 50s here in town, both Saturday morning as well as Sunday morning. Plenty of sunshine, especially throughout the first half of the weekend for your New Year's Eve. And then those temperatures into the afternoon again warmer than where we should be for this time of year. Night and day difference from Christmas Eve and Christmas Day here last weekend in the mid 70s for your Saturday afternoon, and maybe some upper 70s as we ring in the new year on Sunday. But first, let's backtrack. Let's talk about this morning because for the first morning in quite some time, we had morning lows that were above freezing, except for Carrizo Springs briefly dipped down to that 32 degree threshold earlier today. We had an official low of 37 here in San Antonio, 40 up in Kerrville, 33 in Hondo, so just missed that 32 degree mark, 37 in Uvalde and 34 in Pleasanton to kick start to this Wednesday. But welcome changes, especially when it comes to giving the pipes a break and of course the potted plants, sensitive tender vegetation, the pets, things like that, because we had about six Six consecutive days with temperatures at or below freezing, mainly in the mornings there, but you can see that warming trend just a little bit each and every day. That continues this afternoon and it will continue as we head into the second half of the week. This is one of the reasons why, at least today, we've got plenty of sunshine out there. Temperatures are warming efficiently here. This 9 a.m. hour 48 is the temperature over at San Antonio International. It's 50 53 in Gonzales, 55 down 181 in Kennedy, 48 in New Braunfels, and 50 in Rock Springs over in Edwards County. We will monitor for some breezy south wind gusts at times, mainly upwards of about 20 to 25 miles per hour into this afternoon. As of right now, nothing really registering out there. Still somewhat of a calm wind in place, but again, that could change in spots a little bit this afternoon as well. Temperatures warming around the 3 to 4 p.m. time frame here in San Antonio. Our forecast high of about 72 degrees and then we see those temperatures drop off back into the 60s, especially after sunset for any of those Wednesday evening plans that you may be stepping out to 65 by 6 p.m. for dinner time, 60 at 8 p.m. and dropping into the upper 50s later tonight. But before we can get there, just kind of taking a wider view across South Central Texas for those days time highs around 70 up in the hill country Kerrville stretching up to Fredericksburg a little bit warmer across our southern county 71 in Eagle Pass 68 in Del Rio for that forecast high this afternoon. We we're talking about those breezy south winds though those winds turning in from the south is a key player into opening the door for more of that Gulf moisture and humidity to work back into the area. So you can see just throughout the afternoon and into the evening hours today we are expecting those dew points, how we measure the low level moisture to rise. So that's going to lead to some areas of patchy fog tomorrow morning, as well as some areas of drizzle, certainly possible. Some areas of fog could be dense in spots, so that's something to think about if you are stepping out for the morning commute or morning drive tomorrow. And then we've got an isolated chance into the early afternoon for a stray shower east of San Antonio 
Bible. That's thanks to that area of low pressure approaching the Four Corners region. Essentially what that's going to do is just bring in a little bit more energy to our atmosphere when we sync that up with the moisture in place. Sure, maybe a stray shower east of town again early tomorrow afternoon and then we dry things out for the holiday weekend looking a little warm out there that looks to continue into the first few days of 2023 if you can believe it and then maybe our next front could knock those temperatures down just a little bit as we head into the first half of next week so maybe we can skip the jackets for new year's and yep. open up the windows you're not going to need the heavy coats no. that is for sure that's good i mean we used it in you know quite yeah a we bit. used it enough over the past <laughs> yeah. few days let's give it a little bit of a break and head it's time to shine sounds good thank you mia you bet 10 till 10 53 degrees and when we come back why James Cameron took out 10 minutes of gun action from the Avatar sequel and the issue the director of the Knives Out sequel has with the title of the film. A new episode of Case Out Explains is out and it's all about recycling. Not only what can be recycled, but what's actually accepted at recycling facilities because there's definitely a difference. Plus organics, what should go in San Antonio's green and blue bins. The Case That Explains team answers that big question and shows you what happens to all that stuff after it leaves your curb. You can watch this episode right now on KSET.com or on our YouTube page. Well, now to some entertainment news. The director who turned Arnold Schwarzenegger into the Terminator appears to be backing away to a degree from some on-screen violence in his latest film. Plus, one country singer is tired of overpriced concert tickets, and he's making it known. CNN's David Daniel has those stories and more in today's Hollywood Minute. Just breathe. Breathe. James Cameron says he cut about 10 minutes of gunplay action from Avatar The Way of Water. The filmmaker who rose to fame with such films as The Terminator and True Lies tells Esquire Middle East, I don't know if I would want to make that film now. I don't know if I would want to fetishize the gun in our current world. If anyone can name the killer, that person wins our game. Any questions? Ryan Johnson has a complaint about his film Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery, specifically that title. The writer-director tells The Atlantic he wanted to call the sequel simply Glass Onion. I've tried hard to make them self-contained, he told the magazine, noting that with any mystery series, it's a new novel off the shelf every time. What did I do to deserve all this? A roof over my head and a band that don't miss. Zach Bryan thinks concert ticket prices are too high, and he's making his point quite plainly. The rising country star's latest album is titled All My Homies Hate Ticketmaster, live at Red Rocks. On Instagram, Brian vowed to make tickets to his shows as cheap as possible and railed against huge monopolies stealing money from working class people. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. All right, let's get you one final look at what we're expecting throughout the remainder of this Wednesday. Plenty of sunshine, warmer afternoon highs in the upper 60s and low 70s. Tomorrow is cloudy, so it looks a little bit different. You will notice more of that muggy feel with the humidity in place, maybe some patchy fog and drizzle. And then we dry things out and warm things up even more so, guys, as we head into the upcoming New Year's Eve weekend. Outstanding. Yeah. Yep. I'm glad. I'm glad we'll see the sun yes, over the weekend me as well. too. Yeah. Good news there. Thank yeah. you, Mia. Welcome back, Steph. Thank you. Glad you're back. Thanks for joining us. Have a good day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you